Hi, fourth graders. So today we are going to watch the last number of the stars chapter watch, listen to the last number of the stars chapter. Um, I apologize, I can't show you the text. For some reason that feature isn't working on my computer. So I'm gonna go ahead and just read the book out loud to you um, and you can listen today. So chapter 16, well last time we read, actually, Anne-Marie um, had made it to Uncle Henrik's boat. She had taken that package there. We still don't know what's in it. Um, and when she was there, she noticed that she couldn't see any of the Jewish people who they were trying to get to the boat on the boat, and she wondered what was going on. So we are going to finish the book today. Chapter 16 is called, I Will Tell You Just a Little. Poor Blossom, Uncle Henrik said, laughing after dinner that evening. <clears throat> it was bad enough that your mother was going to milk her after all those years of city life. But Anne-Marie, to do it for the very first time, I'm surprised Blossom didn't kick you. Mama laughed too. She sat in a comfortable chair that Uncle Henrik had moved from the, ki from the living room and placed in the corner of the kitchen. Her leg in a clean white cast to the knee was on a footstool. Anne-Marie didn't mind their laughing. It had been funny. When she had arrived back at the farmhouse, she had run along the road to avoid the soldiers who might still be in the woods. Now, carrying nothing, she was in no danger. Mama and Kirsty were gone. There was a note hastily written for Mama that the doctor was taking her in his car to the local hospital that they would be back soon. But the noise from Blossom, forgotten, unmilked, uncomfortable in the barn, had sent Anne-Marie warily out with the milking bucket. She had done her best, trying to ignore Blossom's irritated snorts and tossing head, remembering how Uncle Henrik's hands had worked it with a firm, rhythmic pulling motion. And she had milked. I could have done it, Kirsty announced. You only have to pull and it squirts out. I could do it easily. Anne-Marie rolled her eyes. I'd like to see you try, she thought. Is Ellen coming back? Kirsty asked, forgetting the cow after a moment. She said she'd make a dress for my doll. Anne Marie and I will help you make a dress, Mama told her. Ellen had to go with her parents. Wasn't that a nice surprise that the Rosens came last night to get her? She should have waked me up to say goodbye, Kirsty grumbled, spooning some imaginary food into the painted mouth of the doll she had propped in a chair beside her. Anne Marie, Uncle Henrik said, getting up from the table and pushing back his chair. If you come with me now to the barn, I'll give you a milking lesson. Wash your hands first. Me too, said Kirsty. Not you too, Mama said. Not this time. I need your help here. Since I can't walk very well, you'll have to be my nurse. Kirsty hesitated, deciding whether to argue. Then she said, I'm going to be a nurse when I grow up, not a cow milker. So I have to stay here and take care of Mama. Followed as usual by the kitten, Anne-Marie walked with Uncle Henrik to the barn through a fine misty rain that had begun to fall. It seemed to her that Blossom shook her head happily when she saw Henrik and knew that she would be in good hands again. She sat on the stacked hay and watched while he milked, but her mind was not on the milking. Uncle Henrik, she said, where are the Rosens and the others? I thought you were taking them to Sweden on your boat, but they weren't there. They were there, he told her, leaning forward against the cow's broadside. You shouldn't know this. You remember that I told you it was safer not to know. But, he went on, as his hands moved with their sure and practiced motion, I will tell you just a little, because you were so very brave. Brave? Anne-Marie asked, surprised. No, I wasn't. I was very frightened. You risked your life. But I didn't even think about that. I was only thinking of... He interrupted her, smiling. That's all that brave means, not thinking about the dangers, just thinking about what you must do. Of course you were frightened. I was too today. But you kept your mind on what you had to do. So I did. Now let me tell you about the Rosens. Many of the fishermen have built hidden places in their boats. I have two, down underneath. I have only to lift the boards in the right place, and there is room to hide a few people. Peter and others in the resistance who work with him bring them to me and to the f other fishermen as well. There are people who hide them and help them along the way to Gleehe. Anne-Marie was startled. Peter is in the resistance? Of course, I should have known. He brings Mama and Papa the secret newspaper, De Frit Dins, and he always seems to be on the move. I should have figured it out myself. He's a very, very brave young man, Uncle Henrik said. They all are. Anne-Marie frowned, remembering the empty boat that morning. Were the Rosens and the others there? Then, underneath, when I brought the basket? Uncle Henrik nodded. I heard nothing, Anne-Marie said. Of course not. They had to be absolutely quiet for many hours. The baby was drugged so that it wouldn't wake and cry. Could they hear me when I talked to you? Yes. Your friend Ellen told me later that they heard you, and they heard the soldiers who came to search the boat. Anne-Marie's eyes widened. Soldiers came, she asked. I thought they went the other way after they stopped me. There are many soldiers in Galihi and all along the coast. They are searching the boats now. They know that the Jews are escaping, but they are not sure how. 
and they rarely find them. The hiding places are carefully concealed, and we often pile dead fish on the deck as well. They hate getting their shiny boots sturdied. He turned his head toward her and grinned. Anne-Marie remembered the shiny boots confronting her on the dark path. Uncle Henrik, she said, I'm sure you are right that I shouldn't know everything, but please, would you tell me about the handkerchief? I knew it was important, the packet. That's why I ran through the woods to take it to you, but I thought maybe it was a map. How could a handkerchief be important? He set the filled pail aside and began to wash the cow's udder with a damp cloth. Very few people know about this, Anne-Marie, he said with a serious look. But the soldiers are so angry about the escaping Jews and the fact that they can't find them that they have just started using trained dogs. They had dogs, the, one who, the ones who stopped me on the path? Uncle Henrik nodded. The dogs are trained to sniff about and find where people are hidden. It happened just yesterday on two boats. Those dogs, they go right through the dead fish to the human scent. We were all very, very worried. We thought it meant the end of the escape to Sweden by boat. It was Peter who took the problem to scientists and doctors. Some very fine minds have worked day and night trying to find a solution. And they have created a special drug. I don't know what it is, but it was in the handkerchief. It attracts the dogs, but when they sniff, it ruins their sense of smell. Imagine that. Anne-Marie remembered how the dogs had lunged at the handkerchief, smelled it, and then turned away. Now, thanks to Peter, we will each have such a handkerchief, each boat captain, when the soldiers board our boats, oops, when the soldiers board our boats, we will simply pull the handkerchiefs out of our pockets. The Germans will probably think we all have bad colds. The dogs will sniff about, sniff the handkerchiefs we are holding, and then roam the boat and find nothing. They will smell nothing. Did they bring dogs to your boat this morning? Yes, not 20 minutes after you had gone. I was about to pull away from the dock when the soldiers appeared and ordered me to halt. They came aboard, searched, found nothing. By then, of course, I had the handkerchief. If I had not... Well, his voice trailed off and he didn't finish the sentence. He didn't need to. If she had not found the packet where Mr. Rosen had dropped it, if she had not run through the woods, if the soldiers had taken the basket, if she had not reached the boat in time, all of the ifs whirled in Anne-Marie's head. They are safe in Sweden now, she asked. You're sure? Uncle Henrik stood. He patted the cow's head. I saw them ashore. There were people waiting to take them to shelter. They are quite safe there. But what if the Nazis invade Sweden? Will the Rosens have to run away again? That won't happen. For reasons of their own, the Nazis want Sweden to remain free. It is very complicated. Henry's thoughts turned to her friends, hiding under the deck of the Ingeborg. It must have been awful for them, so many hours there, she murmured. Was it dark in the hiding place? Dark and cold and very cramped. And Miss Rosen was seasick, even though we were not on the water very long. It is a short distance, as you know. But they are courageous people, and none of that mattered when they stepped ashore. The air was fresh and cool in Sweden. The wind was blowing. The baby was beginning to wake as I said goodbye to them. I wonder if I will ever see Ellen again, Anne-Marie said sadly. You will, little one. You saved her life after all. Someday you will find her again. Someday the war will end, Uncle Henrik said. All wars do. Now then, he added, stretching. That was quite a milking lesson, was it not? Uncle Henrik, Anne-Marie shrieked, and then began to laugh. Look, she pointed. The god of thunder has fallen into the milk pail. Right? So chapter 17 is all this long time. The war would end. Uncle Henrik had said that, and it was true. The war ended almost two long years after, later. Anne-Marie was 12. Church bells rang all over Copenhagen. Early that May evening, the Danish flag was raised everywhere. People stood in the streets and wept as they sang the national anthem of Denmark. Anne-Marie stood on the balcony of the apartment with her parents and sister and watched. Up and down the street and across the other side, she could see flags and banners in almost every window. She knew that many of these apartments were empty. For nearly two years now, neighbors had tended the plants and dusted the furniture and polished the candlesticks for the Jews who had fled. Her mother had done so for the Rosens. It is what friends do, Mama had said. Now neighbors had entered each unoccupied waiting apartment, opened a window, and hung a symbol of freedom there. This evening, Miss Johansson's face was wet with tears. Kirsty waving a small flag, sang. Her blue eyes were bright. Even Kirsty was growing up. No longer was she a light-hearted chatterbox of a child. Now she was taller, more serious, and very thin. She looked like the pictures of Lisa Seven in the old album. Peter Nielsen was dead. It was a painful fact to recall on this day when there was so much joy in Denmark. But Anne-Marie forced herself to think of her red-headed almost brother, and how devastating the day was when they received the news that Peter had been captured and executed by the Germans in the public square at Rev... Rev Rivagen in Copenhagen. He had written a letter to them from
from prison the night before he was shot. It had said simply that he loved them, that he was not afraid, and that he was proud to have done what he could for his country, and for the sake of all free people. He had asked in the letter to be buried beside Lise. But even that was not to be for Peter. The Nazis refused to return the bodies of the young men they had shot there. They simply buried them there when they were killed and marked the graves with only numbers. Later, Anne-Marie had gone to the place with her parents and had laid flowers there on the bleak, numbered ground. That night, Anne-Marie's parents told her the truth about Lisa's death at the beginning of that year. She was part of the resistance, too, Papa had explained, part of the group that fought for her country in whatever ways they could. We didn't know, Mama added. She didn't tell us. Peter did after she died. Oh, Papa, Anne-Marie cried. Mama, they didn't shoot Lise, did they, the way they did Peter in the public square with people watching? She wanted to know, wanted to know it all, but wasn't certain that she could bear the knowledge. But Papa shook his head. She was with Peter and the others in a cellar where they held secret meetings to make plans. Somehow the Nazis found out and they raided the place that evening. They all ran different ways trying to escape. Some of them were shot, Mama told her sadly. Peter was shot in the arm. Do you remember that Peter's arm was bandaged and in a sling at Lisa's funeral? He wore a coat over it so that no one would notice, and a hat to hide his red hair. The Nazis were looking for him. Amory didn't remember. She hadn't noticed. The whole day had been a blur of grief. But what about Lise? she asked. If she wasn't shot, what happened? From the military car, they saw her running and simply ran her down. So it was true what you said, that she was hit by a car? It was true, Papa told her. They were all so young, Mama said, shaking her head. She blinked, closed her eyes for a moment, and took a long, deep breath. So very, very young, with so much hope. Now remembering least, Anne-Marie looked from the balcony down the street and saw that below, amid the music, singing, and the sound of the church bells, people were dancing. It brought back another memory, the memory of Lise so long ago wearing the yellow dress, dancing with Peter on the night they announced their engagement. She turned and went to her bedroom, where the blue trunk still stood in the corner, as it had all these years. Opening it, Anne-Marie saw that the yellow dress had begun to fade. It was discolored at the edges where it had lain so long in folds. Carefully, she spread open the skirt of the dress and found the place where Ellen's necklace lay hidden in the pocket. The little star of David still gleamed. Papa, she said, returning to the balcony, where her father was standing with the others, watching the rejoicing crowd. She opened her hand and showed him the necklace. Can you fix this? I have kept it all this long time. It was Ellen's. Her father took it from her and examined the broken clasp. Yes, he said, I can fix it. When the Rosens come home, you can give it back to Ellen. Until then, Anne-Marie told him, I will wear it myself. Okay, and that is the end of the book. So I'm now going to read the afterword just because it is it explains so much about what's true and what is not in the story. So I will get started there. How much of Anne Marie's story is true? I know I will be asked that. Let me try to tell you here where the fact ends and fiction begins. Anne Marie Johansson is a child of my imagination. Though she grew there from stories told to me by my friend Annalise Platt, to whom this book is dedicated, who herself was a child in Copenhagen during the long years of the German occupation. I had always been fascinated and moved by Annalise's descriptions, not only of the personal deprivation that her family and their neighbors suffered during those years and the sacrifices they made, but even more by the greater picture she drew for me of the courage and integrity of the Danish people under the leadership of the king that they loved so much, Christian X. So I, met, so I created little Anne-Marie and her family, set them down in a Copenhagen apartment on a street where I have walked myself and imagined their life there against the real events of 1943. Denmark surrendered to Germany in 1940, it is true, and it was true for the reasons that Papa explained to Anne-Marie. The country was small and undefended, with no army of any size. The people would have been destroyed if they had tried to defend themselves against the huge German forces. So surely, with great sorrow, King Christian surrendered, and overnight the soldiers moved in. From then on, for five years, they occupied the country. Visible on almost every street corner, always armed and spit-shined, they controlled the newspapers, the rail system, the government, schools, and hospital, and day-to-day -day existence of the Danish people. But they never controlled King Christian. It is true that he rode alone on his horse from the palace every morning unguarded and greeted his people. And though it seems so charming as to be a flight of author's fancy, the story that Papa told Anne-Marie of the soldier who asked the Danish teenager, who is that man? That story is recorded in one of the documents that still remain from that time. It is true, too, that in August 1943, the Danes sank their own entire navy in Copenhagen Harbor as the German ships approached to take over the ships for their own use. My friend Annalise remembers it, 
and many who were children at the time would have been awakened, as little Kirsty was, by the explosions and the fiercely lighted sky as the ships burned. On the New Year of the Jewish High Holidays in 1943, those who gathered to worship at the synagogue in Copenhagen, as the fictional Rosens did, were warned by the rabbi that they were to be taken and relocated by the Germans. The rabbi knew because a high German official to told the Danish government, which passed the information along to the leaders of the Jewish community. The name of that German was G.F. Duckwitz, and I hope that even today, so many years later, there are flowers on his grave because he was a man of compassion and courage. And so the Jews, all but a few who didn't believe the warning, fled the first raids. They fled into the arms of the Danes who took them in, fed them, clothed them, hid them, and helped them along to safety in Sweden. In the weeks following the Jew Jewish New Year, almost the entire Jewish population of Denmark, nearly 7,000 people, was smuggled across the sea to Sweden. The little hand-hemmed linen handkerchief that Anne-Marie carried to her uncle? Surely something made up by an author who wanted to create a heroine out of a fictional girl. No. The handkerchief, as well as part of history. After the Nazis began to use police dogs to sniff out hidden passages on the fishing boats, Swedish scientists worked swiftly to, pre to prevent such detection. They carried a powerful powder composed of dried rabbit's blood and powder. Blood attracted the dogs, and when they sniffed it, the powder numbed their noses and destroyed temporarily their sense of smell. Almost every boat captain used such a permeated handkerchief, and many lives were saved by the device. The secret op the secret operations that saved the Jews were orchestrated by the Danish resistance, which, like all resistance movements, was composed mainly of very young and very brave. Peter Nielsen, though he's fictional, represents those courageous and idealistic young people, so many of whom had died at the hands of the enemy. In reading the resistance leaders in Denmark, I came across an account of a young man named Kim Malf. Brun, who was eventually captured and educated by the Jews when he was only 21 years old. I read his story as I had read many others, turning the pages, skimming here and there. This sabotage, that tactic, this capture, that escape. After a while, even courage becomes routine to the reader. Then, quite unprepared, I turned the page to find a photograph of the young man. He wore a turtleneck sweater, and his thick, light hair was windblown. His eyes looked out at me, unwavering on the page. Seeing him there, so terribly young, broke my heart. But seeing the quiet determination in his boyish eyes made me determined, too, to tell his story, and that of all the Danish people who shared his dream. So I would like to end this paragraph written by that young man in a letter to his mother the night before he was put to death. And I want you to remember that you must not dream yourselves back to the times before the war, but the dream for you all, young and old, must be to create an ideal of human decency and not a narrow-minded and prejudiced one. That is a great gift our country hungers for, something every little peasant boy can look forward to, and with pleasure feel he is part of, something he can work and fight for. Surely that gift, the gift of a world of human decency, is the one that all countries hunger for still. I hope that this story of Denmark and its people will remind us all that such a world is possible. All right, and that is the end of Number of the Stars. I hope you guys have enjoyed listening to the read aloud. Um, it's such a great book and I love reading it every year. Thank you. Bye.